Executive Director of the Neurofibromatosis Network, and we would like to welcome you to our webinar series. These webinars have proven to be an excellent way for the network to reach individuals across the country. Tonight we're having our Back to School webinar using um, our Back to School webinar, and we will be discussing using iPads for education and productivity. The webinar will be presented by Nicole Wecklinger, and she's an occupational therapist with St. Louis Children's Hospital. She works with Dr. David Gutman at the NF Clinic. She's going to discuss apps and resources that can benefit our children with NF1. Some webinar instructions. Um, after Nicole's talk, we'll have some time for questions and answers. To write a question to be read out loud, click the question box at the lower portion of the webinar control panel. If that webinar control panel is in your way, you can click on the orange rectangular button with the arrow at the top left portion of the control panel. This might be necessary to have complete view of the presentation. So tonight's presentation also has um, a web feature. It's actually Nicole's webcam. So if you look at the top of your screen, the very top left, there's three buttons. It says Layout, then it says Zoom, then it says Webcam. Click on Webcam, and it says, then it'll say Show All Webcams. Click on that, and you'll be able to see Nicole's um, iPod on there. Okay, if you would like to make that screen larger, the screen that has um, Nicole's webcam on it that's showing an iPad, go ahead and move that over to the right and it'll make it larger. If you would like to see the PowerPoint, you can go ahead and move it to the left and that will make the PowerPoint um, a little bit bigger. If you want to take just a few minutes to play with that. And then I would like to introduce to you Nicole Recklinger and we would like to get started. Nicole, I'm not saying your last name right. Can you pronounce that for me? Sure thing, it's Weckerlin. Weckerlin, thank you, thank you, yeah. thank you. Thank, thank you for joining us tonight. And it looks like we were struggling a little bit before the webinar trying to make sure that the webcam is working, and it is. As long as people click up on that third button at the top left side, which says Layout, Zoom, then Webcam, and then it says Show All Webcams, everybody can see it. It's looking like it's working just fine. Great, great, great. I know. I thought it'd be ironic if, if the, the technology piece didn't work on the technology presentation. So that's always good that it's working. So. <laughs> but I think we're good to go now. All right. Um, well, good evening. Again, my name is Nicole Weckerlin. I am an occupational therapist at St. Louis Children's Hospital. Um, I work in the Neurofibromatosis Center with Washington University, so um, I do work alongside Dr. Gutman. Um, I also work in a numerous other clinics, the Cerebral Palsy Center, Rett Syndrome Clinic, um, Cardiac, NICU follow-up. Um, and my role as an OT is, is kind of different than the more traditional OTs. Um, I am a what you would call almost a consultant. So a lot of times when families come in to have an appointment with their neurologist, um, I give an, an OT consult. So that may be on technology. Um, it may be on uh, self-care uh, activities of daily living. It may be on splinting. It may be on um, adaptive equipment, school or IEP concerns. Um, it just it just depends. Um, most recently, and I would say in probably the last oh gosh three or four years, my role has kind of shifted, and I've kind of become the iPad OT. Which I must make it clear right now, I do not get any um, benefit from Apple, which is which is a bummer. Um, so and and many people have asked me why um, why the iPad and why not the Android devices or why not the Chromebooks. And honestly, I'm you know, my preference is this because this is what I know. This is what I'm most familiar with. This is the, what I've had the most experience with. Um, I have found that they um, feature a great deal of accessibility features for children with special needs. So, um, like I said, I don't have any financial tie-in or buy into this. And, and I'm sorry if it does shift more towards the iPad, but again, that's, that's kind of my specialty at this point. Um, in the last probably two years um, at Children's Hospital, we have created what you would call an iPad lab. And I use the word lab very loosely because um, it's a mobile lab. It's, a, it's my little suitcase with all kinds of iPad accessories. 
But what I had found is, is that in doing these consults with the neurologist, um, I get maybe 15 minutes, maybe 30 minutes to go in with that family to discuss all of their OT concerns. And a lot of times it ends up being school is an issue. Um, the kids are falling behind in school. They're not keeping up. Handwriting is a big struggle. And that's where the recommendation of the iPad has come in. And so what we've done in our, with our little iPad lab is basically I've been able to have one-on-one -on -one OT sessions with those kiddos and their families to get their iPads set up, ready for school, um, if we need to work with uh, the, the school as far as giving them information. But it's really kind of that one-on-one -on -one session. to It's kind of a one-shot deal. It's billed as an OT um, outpatient you know, visit. Um, but it's really to get them up and running so that they can take this to the schools and, and put it to use. So having said that, um, tonight I uh, have a hefty list of objectives that I would always like to accomplish, but one of which is to just learn the implications of the iPad and its use in the school setting. And right now, you know, I think most commonly across the board, we think of the iPad as entertainment. And then very much it can be. It's a great use of entertainment. You can surf the web. You can get on YouTube. You can watch videos and music. So it very much is um, a, a form of entertainment. It's in a very mainstream technology. Um, the iPad, though, can also be useful as um, a reward. So it can be that piece to, you know, if there's a behavior issue or they can reward. You know, that's, you know, if you get your homework done, you can do 15 minutes on the iPad. Um, the iPad, though, can also be used as a way to practice skills. So I know there's therapists out there, speech therapists and occupational therapists that use it to work on those language skills, to work on those vocabulary skills, um, fine motor skills. There's some apps there that help work on manual dexterity or um, even handwriting as far as directionality is concerned. But then there's also the piece that the iPad can be used for communication. And that's a whole nother, uh, that's a whole nother webinar, but um, a lot of times it can be used for augmentative communication, for um, expressive communication as far as there's some really great AugCom apps and stuff like that. So we're seeing sometimes kids are, are using those as their dedicated communication devices versus some of the more traditional ones. But what I'm here to talk about is how we can use this iPad as a productivity tool. And I think that's really powerful um, because to me it's the way that kind of levels the game for a lot of kids out there who struggle in school. It's a way of putting a piece of technology in their hands to where they're not penalized if they can't um, write fast enough or be productive enough or be organized enough. So um, that's really um, where my passion kind of falls into, is using this device and putting it to use in that way. So tonight we'll also look at just some better productivity. Um, I kind of joke and I say that most of us use our iPad probably 25% to its max potential. Um, it doesn't come with a manual. The big trick on that is you got to go to the iBook store. You, you have to download the manual, and that's how you know how to use it. But there's all these little tips and tricks and little hidden um, functions and features of the iPad that you don't know. So I'd like to kind of show you the, some of those features, but also um, show that things that just come with the iPad, like um, the notes features, um, your, your Safari, your mail, all that kind of stuff, those can be very useful as well. Then the next piece that we'll show you tonight is how to utilize third-party apps or those classroom apps that can really increase student productivity and thus their functional academic independence. So things that we can put in their hands that you guys can use right away um, to, to help with this. Um, we'll also take a look at some accessibility features and other accessories. And then also we'd like to increase just your general knowledge of um, what's out there as far as resources for the iPad. All right, so the iPad in school, and um, this is where I kind of have to be the OT in me and I have to go off into my soapbox, but the idea is, you know, to use technology to participate and complete classroom homework and assignments. Um, the bottom line is we want to prevent those motor skills or that fatigue factor or those executive functioning issues from negatively impacting their academic performance. Okay, um, 
keyboarding and typing um, as functional alternatives for handwriting for written communication. And this is where I feel like it's important to kind of get in, in from this mindset is when children are in kindergarten and even first grade, handwriting is actually a subject. There's a dedicated time um, in, the, in the curriculum or in the day where the kids are practicing their letters and their numbers. They're working from, you know, how to make the letter A. We go top to bottom. We go left to right. We're working on spacing, all those kind of things. When we skip ahead to those older grades, um, second, third grade, uh, obviously fourth and fifth grade, um, we are no longer, you know, setting aside that time, but now we're adding on to that. So you better know how to write, but you also throw in punctuation, sentence structure, sentence syntax, creating a paragraph. So now we have those kiddos who may have those visual memory problems, who it doesn't come automatically for them to make the letter A or the letter C or the letter D. They're still thinking about how to form the letters, but at the same time, they're supposed to formulate a sentence and a paragraph and a main idea and all these things. So it's just becoming more and more demanding on them. And really, I think third grade is that age where, where the demands increase so much that we see that gap start to widen. So that's where we see the kiddos really starting to fall behind as far as work, where, where the handwriting load becomes um, a, a big challenge for them. So that's when we really, am, I really um, support early keyboarding and typing skills um, as when they're in preschool or they're in kindergarten or in first grade to be working on typing their name just as much as writing their name. Because if they do need to transition down the road, they're not going to be any faster at writing if they haven't gotten that early exposure to keyboarding and typing. Um, and I think there's a lot of value in keyboarding and typing. It's still letter discrimination. It's still fine motor. It's still visual memory. So there's an aspect there that's just as important. Um, so I also think the iPad is a nice piece because um, it's portable. It encourages inclusion. Um, oftentimes, if a kiddo gets access to a computer, it's in the corner. It's on a desktop. Um, so it kind of takes them away from the rest of their peers. If they're younger and they're having to do something and it's circle time, those iPads can be brought down there just as easily. Um, the other piece of it is that they're not having to lug around all these books in their backpack or keeping a set at home and a set at school. So it does help alleviate some of that, those demands as well. And the iPad is very inclusive. I mean, it can provide augmentative, expressive, and written communication. In some instances, we're lucky enough that a kiddo can have a device for communication um, as well as use it for productivity. Um, in some other instances, though, there's kiddos that need a definite, dedicated, separate OGCOM device, and then they need a separate um, productivity device. Um, the fact that there's online books now um, helps greatly. Uh, they're much more accessible. Those online books also um, have a lot of features, like they can highlight the words when you're reading. They have um, text-to-speech now. Um, so there's a lot of, you know, you can do contrast when you're reading it as far as um, visually stimulating. So there, there's features that you can't maybe get with the paper kind of book. And I think the most important thing is using this piece of technology like the iPad, it just encourages independence so therefore, less dependence on scribes. I know a lot of times our families come to us and say um, they have a paraprofessional because they have to scribe for them. And um, while I think that's great that they're getting assistance, I also kind of question, well, I, you know, if they had something like a device or an iPad, would they be able to get this done more um, independently if they were able to dictate or if they were able to um, type or, or things like that rather than have to use a scribe? The other thing I have to, to point out is a lot of times um, we see in IEPs or 504s that we can shorten assignments. So if a kiddo is struggling with getting those spelling words done and they're having to do 10 spelling words every night and write them out and the handwriting is just too demanding for them, we'll sometimes get the, get the input that maybe the teachers have shortened it and said, you know what, just have them do five of those, those uh, spelling words. Don't do all ten. And I question that because I feel like they're losing out on that academic content, um, which they might be very capable of doing, 
So what if we modify, what if we accommodate by letting them have an iPad or letting them have a computer and typing those spelling words versus um, writing them, but letting them do the full 10 spelling words, letting them do the full um, assignment. That way we're not, we're not compromising any of those academics. So I think that's very important to think too. Um, so that's kind of my soapbox. I also say to other OTs that we almost kind of have to redefine our role as occupational therapists. For the longest time, we were always known as the handwriting specialist, um, which is which is great. I think we've done you know cursive, we've done handwriting without tears, and I think for many kiddos, those are those are very appropriate um, goals. But I also feel like we need to kind of expand and think about being written communication specialist. Um, and when I say that, that means we have to kind of broaden our role to think of, okay, it, it might be writing, but it might be typing. It might be keyboarding. It might be dictation. Um, what equipment or what supplies or intervention or support can we give them to make them more functional in a productivity um, role at school? So, um, and I also have to say, too, that that often I get this from parents that come in is, well, I still want my kid to write. And absolutely, writing is a very functional skill. Um, I like to say that the things that they should practice writing should be, you know, their first and last name, their address, their phone number, um, their date of birth, all those really functional um, pieces of information. I call them the application information. So what would you have to fill out if you were writing an application? Um, those are very important things to write, but I also don't want to see kids fall behind. So if, if we have to do a combination of writing and typing, um, that's great. If we have to go to all typing, I just feel like what can we do to keep these kids to stay up with their peers and make them independent and functional? All right, so now we get to the meat of it. Um, what we're going to do is start with just the iPad itself, and these are built-in apps. So these are apps that come with your iPad. You don't have to go to the iTunes store or anything like that. They come with your iPad. So I'm going to bring mine up here. And these are very just simple ways of using what you already have. And one of the things that is always on, the cal um, always on your iPad is your calendar. And if you look at the calendar here, I have actually um, preset subjects so that they repeat every day. So this is just an example. Like if we look at the 19th here, uh, let's see, I'm going to go to the day. Every day up here in the corner, we have language arts, we have science, and we have math. Okay, so they're always going to repeat. This is just for the ease of not having that kiddo in class have to set it up each time. But let's say, for instance, they are in language arts. And as they're in there, they're listening and finding out that the homework that night is to read chapter two. So we are going to add that, but we are going to save for the event only, because we only want to do it for today, because that's only today's assignment. Okay? Then we go to math class. And we find out the homework is worksheet five. And again, we're going to save for this event only. Okay? What we're doing is basically just doing our little um, assignment notebook, which is what I know most elementary kids have to do on a daily basis anyhow. Um, they write it usually in their binder or their main folder. We're just replacing that um, here. We're just doing the same thing, but we've already preset their subjects so they don't have to do anything like that. But this way, when they get home, um, when they switch to this little, this little, I don't know if you saw what I just did, this little uh, magnifying glass here is going to give us a running list of what, which I like to say it's kind of like the to-do list. So if you look on the 19th, I see I had science class, I had language arts, I have to do chapter two, I have to do math, I have to do a worksheet five. So it's kind of just broken down very simple for them that that's their to-do list for the day. And then as parents, you kind of can keep up and know what they need to get done. Um, so that's an important way to use the calendar. Nicole, can I interrupt yes. for just a moment? We're looking at it, and um, if you could just tip the iPad a little bit. Um, we can see it, but it's not real clear. Just move the iPad one way or the other. Not quite. Let's see. 
And you know, I played with this and I know that the the resolution is not the best. Um, and I don't I, know what the that must solution. be a must be solution. Yeah. Okay, that looks like probably as best as you're going to All get right. it. Okay, okay, I apologize. Um, yeah, so the, the fine line reading might be tough to, once I get into some of the apps, if you can kind of see the general um, outline of it, I think, I think that will suffice, but some of the fine line font and typing might be hard to pick up. Okay. So um, one of the other ways that you can is to set um, social reminders, and I like to give the example of, I had a kiddo that she's very high functioning, um, she was in high school, um, just had some sensory issues and didn't always um, remember after a meal to, to wipe her face. And her mom said, if I was just there with her after the meals to just tell her to wipe her face, I think it would be so much better because um, I just worry that it just really puts a, an interference with her peers. So we actually set a timer, and I know it's probably hard to pick it up on here, but at 11.35, there's a repeating um, reminder on her calendar that says check face. And no one had to know about it. It just went off on her, her iPad or her iPhone. And then she just would take out her little pocket mirror that she had in her purse, check her face. No one had to know. And then go about her business after lunch. Um, but again, kind of help with that social cueing and, and, and that little piece there um, that can really make a difference for, for kids, especially the ones that are, that are in, uh, in high school and, and college. So that is one way to use the calendar. The other thing that I try to encourage, just in your contact information here, um, I don't have any contacts in there that you can see, but um, what you can do is I always say, um, like when they come into clinic, I say make a, make a contact um, information for Dr. Gutman. And then in that notes, put whatever medication or whatever your visit entailed, any of his recommendations. But I really try to get our kids early on and kind of empower them to know their medical information, know the medications they're on, um, be a part of it. Um, for one, as parents, now you have kind of a walking medical file, so you have that information accessible to you right away. But also, I like that piece that we're making our kids um, an active participant in their medical care. And then the other built-in app that is great is your camera. And I have it hidden here. Your camera is terrific, though. Your camera, um, it can record exercises. So if you went to PT and you need to remember how those exercises were done, you can record them. Um, they're, they're good for capturing, OK, this is how I should be positioned. This is how that orthotic, that splint, or that brace, this is how it's properly put on. Um, this is the right equipment. If I have to be placed in a stander or a gait trainer, these are where the straps go. So the camera can be a really powerful tool. tool. The other thing is there's sports enhancement apps out there. So one of them is called like Video Coach or Coach My Video. And they're basically meant to be um, sports analysis um, apps. So if you were you know, trying to analyze your batting stance. You could annotate over it. You could record your voice over it or take your finger and draw a line or on, on how it should work. Those are really great apps, though, for um, gait training, for home exercise programs, um, for you know, balance activities, things that you need feedback. It could be a good way to communicate between therapists. Um, but I think it's, a, it's an underutilized um, app that we can use as far as therapy and medical care. So those are very, very important. So what we're going to go through next is those little hidden tips and secrets um, for your iPad. Um, right now, I think we are at iOS 8.4.1. I think a new update just came out a couple days ago. Um, but these are just features that are in your iPad, um, some that you may already know, so bear with me, but some that you may not know. So we're going to go through a couple of these, and one of which is um, Basically, creating folders, and I always say this is important because when we're asking a kiddo to use an iPad for schoolwork or for productivity, what I don't want them to do is swiping, 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 trying to get to screens and finding things, okay? Um, we really try to limit and put folders, like if there's one school folder to put it in there. And an example of this is um, if I want to merge any of these folder, these apps together, 
I hold on it and it wiggles. When I place it on top of each other, it creates a folder and then I can name it whatever I want. So I'm going to name it school. Okay. When I want it to stop wiggle, I hit the home button and it stops. Okay. But that's just a way to keep them more on task and to keep everything more condensed. Now to undo that, I would just hold it here, drag it back out. I can go in here and get this one out. These are some of my favorite apps I'm going to get to show you guys here in a moment. Um, but that's a way, and that's also a way to delete an app. So um, if you notice when I hold it on here, the ones that have an X are the ones that I can delete, and those are because they are third-party apps. So I went to iTunes and I got them. If they do not have an X in the upper left corner, you cannot delete them. So for example, the App Store, go figure, they won't let you, de they won't let you delete that. So, um, but that's a way of uh, creating folders. To um, close apps, and if you double click your home button, these are all your apps that you have running in the background. So if you get in and out of an app, you're not truly closing it. You, to truly close it, you have to swipe upward, and this will actually shut that app down. And that's important because if you've got a lot of apps running in the background, that is going to uh, wear your battery down. Okay. The other thing is multitasking gestures. And the way you find that is if you go into settings and you go into general, you'll see where it says multitasking gestures, okay? When you turn that on, it allows you to move back and forth between apps. So if I take my whole hand, and I don't know that I even have, I can move to another app. What I'm going to do, let me open this one up. So when I have multitasking on, I can move back and forth, okay? Now, that can be useful, but to kids that have some motor issues or have uh, motor control, that can be very frustrating. Before you know it, they are somehow in an app that they did not mean to do. I usually recommend to turn that off. And once you do, you cannot go anywhere as far as getting in and out of apps like that, okay? The next uh, little trip is, trick is a single home button uh, selection. So if you, if you look down here, and I know it's very hard to see, but on the bottom of your screen, um, how many dots do you have? They should be in a horizontal line, is how many um, screens you have. So I have four dots right here, which means I have one, two, three, four screens, okay? Now, I do a lot of this stuff, so I have a lot of apps on here. I'm not probably not the best person to, to be an example. I always say for the kids, I usually like to have one or two screens as far as navigation, so they're not swiping all over the place. If you've gotten to the end and you want to get back to your home screen, click your home button. It'll take you right back, so it's just a quick way to get there, okay? Another thing is to search. So if you want to search for anything, if you swipe down and you take probably right below um, the time there, swipe down, you can type whatever you're looking for. So if I was looking for my camera, that's a quick way that I can just find something, okay? So that's the way you search. To do your notification center, or I'm sorry, your control center, if you're down here from the bottom, and I'm, there it is and you swipe up, this is just a quick control center to your wireless, your airplane, your brightness or your volume level, um, your camera is down here, your timer. Again, it's just another quick way to, to pull that out versus going into settings. Um, to take a screenshot, that is if you, you um, like for example, if I wanted to take a screenshot of what you're seeing right now, I would hold my home button and the button on your side here simultaneously and that takes a picture and what it will do is it will if you go to photos and I'm gonna find my photos like this it drops it right in your camera roll so that picture that I just took there it is right there okay that's how you take a screenshot all right um, for instance, if there is a case where the kids are going to websites, let's say, and I'm just making this up, like if they got to go to Starfall or they go to Raz Kids, um, there is a way to kind of bookmark. 
So if you are in Safari, and I am just going to open a browser here, and let's just say I want to go to Starfall. And now Starfall has their own apps. This is probably not the best um, example, but I think it's important, like if there's a login screen that the kids have to get to time and time, and they're, it's difficult for them to type in the address, and if you want to save this, you're going to go up in this corner here. Upper right-hand corner, there is a little box with an arrow. And you are going to say Add to Home Screen. And you can name it whatever you want. Right here it says Starfall. And when I add it, there it is right there. Okay. Now, it is not an app. It's a bookmark. It's a shortcut. So when I hit it, it goes right to that Safari uh, page and opens it up. So we kind of joke and say that's like making your own app, even though it's really not a true app. It's just a bookmark. Okay. Something important, though, um, and we're going to go into, well, we'll go back to this in just a moment. Um, let's go to the next screen because these are two of uh, probably the most important features that come with the iPad, um, one of which is called guided access. And guided access is basically being able to lock a kiddo into an app, okay, or selecting what you want them to access in that app, okay. It will make all of the home buttons, the volume button, the on-off button unresponsive, okay. The other things that we can do is we can select certain areas or icons on the screen to be unresponsive. So I think that's a important so that goes at the bottom of your screen and if you hit that then it takes it to the iTunes store we don't want that okay or if there's a, a kiddo that tends to perseverate on certain things and maybe keeps hitting the volume button over and over and over or um, tends to you know get stuck on one feature of that app you can also block that out so it is um, I'll show you here in a moment the area remains the same even if the screen changes and you'll see what that is like so to enable your guided access, this is what you're going to do. Go into settings. You'll go into general, which is right here, and you will go into accessibility. Scroll down and turn guided access on. Okay. Once you turn it on, it is going to ask, it's going to prompt you to set a four-digit passcode. But that's all you have to do. Um, from here on out, you've ena enabled guided access. So that means when you go into any app, and I'm just going to pick an app here, okay, so for example, I'm going to start this app here. All right, so I want to play this game, okay? However, I want this kiddo to be able to just focus on what the app is asking them to do, which is to find these certain things. All right, I don't want them to use all these functions down here because it ends up changing the settings or it ends up kind of distracting them. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my home button, and you have to do this kind of fast. You're going to triple click it. You're going to select guided access. Okay, and it says guided access started. Okay, um, iPads are very smart, so if you've used guided access with an app, it remembers what you did. Okay, so let me go back out. Hold on just a moment, it didn't like my passcode here. Okay, so this is what it should look like. So um, once I press resume or I press start, in some cases, if it was a brand new app I had not used guided access in, it's going to go up to the screen, but all of those home buttons, all of those volume buttons, all of those power buttons are going to be unresponsive. The next thing I can do is maybe I don't want them to be able to press these buttons down here. So I can take my finger and I can circle 
areas that I don't want them to be able to access. So it's graying that out, okay? The other really useful thing is down here on the bottom where it says time limit is I can set a timer. So I can set it for one minute, two minutes, 15 minutes, okay? Why that is useful is, is if we have kids that have difficulty transitioning and they say you tell them five more minutes and it becomes a very source of frustration and stress when you're trying to take that iPad away from them, this will help you not have to be the bad guy anymore. That timer, when it, that 15 minutes is up, is if that's the time that you set, the um, passcode screen is going to pop up. So they can't do anything unless um, they have that password, okay? So if we want to start guided access here, we can play this game, but we cannot. I'm trying to press the home button. I can't get out. I'm trying to click the on off. I can't do that. Um, I want to mess with the buttons down here. They are grayed out, so I can't do anything. Okay. I can only play the app, which is what we want them to do. All right. Now, to get out, you triple click the home button again. You punch in that four-digit passcode that you had set up in your settings and press end. Okay. Now, these buttons down here that I grayed out, now I can hit them and they're going to do something, okay? The home button, now I can hit it and I can get out of the app. So it goes back to using it just the way it, it was before, okay? The other really important um, feature that's built in is the speech portion, okay? So if you go into settings, you go into general, you go into accessibility, Okay, and at the very top of accessibility, you're going to see where it says vision. Um, at the bottom of that category, it says speech. When you click that, you have two options. You have speak selection and you have speak screen. Okay, um, you also have the option to do what kind of voice you want. So if you need an English dialect, if you need an Australian accent, this is the time to do it. You can, you can put that in there. You can also um, have the speaking rate either be very slow or very fast. And you also have the option to highlight the words as you are going, which I highly recommend because I think um, for many of our kiddos, having that auditory paired with that visual is really powerful. So I think for reading purposes, that really can help them. All right, so we have both of those enabled. Let me show you the difference on what those is. So what those are. Um, if I go into my notes here, all right, speak selection means that when I select a text, so right here I'm going to highlight this, and now I can cut, copy, paste, I can do all these fancy things, but I can also speak it. Today is a rainy Wednesday. I wonder if the Cardinals will get rained out. Okay. They did not. They're playing right now if you, if you needed to know. But at any rate, speak selection is that piece where you can kind of cut and paste. You can highlight what you want, and then you can have it read to you. Okay? Speak screen is when you want the whole darn screen read. So this is useful if you don't have the time to tediously cut and paste, um, or if you have like a whole email that you want to read or a whole document. And the difference with that is speak selection, I kind of, you know, tapped it and cut and paste. Speak screen, I'm going to take my two fingers and I'm going to swipe downward. Today is the rainy Wednesday. I wonder if the Cardinals will get rained out. Okay, so that's the difference. Now, having said that, I'm going to show you guys how this can be very effective um, for, like, say, schoolwork. So if you go into Safari, and I'm going to pull up CNN. And I'm sure there's going to be more sad news than good news on here, but I just want to illustrate how this can be effective if kiddos are using a research project or they're having to go to the web to find information.
All right, so here I am on CNN site, and it is very, very overwhelming, very distractible. Um, there are all kinds of stuff. There's ads. There's all kinds of stuff. I just want to read this article. So I click this article here. Okay, now that I've got to this specific article, if I look on my browser in the upper left-hand corner, there's like little lines right there. That is called a reader, okay? What a reader will do is when I click it, it will extract only the text, maybe a picture, but only the text or the meat of that article. So it took away all those distractions. It took away the advertisements, the banner ads, the, the miscellaneous you know, things on the side. Um, so now I've got the actual article. What I can do now is take my two fingers and swipe from the top. Story highlights. Trump on Hillary Clinton's emails and his own polling search. Watch CNN special report. The Donald Trump interview at 9 p.m. And it will read the entire um, article for me. So again, very useful for those kiddos who have, you know, reading issues who need to see not only um, to have it spoken and read at the same time. So I think that's a very, very important one. So those are two great um, little features in the iPad. Um, as far as apps, oh, wait, let me go on here too. Um, one of the biggest things that I think I get from teachers or just school districts in general is, or, or parents is, I really don't want to send an iPad to school. Um, there's just too much out there. They'll, they'll get on YouTube. They'll play Angry Birds all day. Um, you know, there's a lot of lot of risk that that's involved. One thing that I think is underutilized is the restriction features. Um, so if you go into settings, let me just close this here. We're going to go into settings, go into general, and if you scroll down, whoops, get to general again. Down here it says restrictions. Okay? And here's my, I have to punch in another passcode that I have for my restrictions. You can take off Safari, you could take off the camera, you could take off FaceTime, you could take off the iTunes and the App Store, that way they can't buy any apps. You, you can actually prevent them from installing apps, deleting apps, or making in-app purchases. That's huge. That's that app that the kiddos that's free that they buy and if they want to get coins or whatever, then it starts free. So you can just just disable those, okay? Um, this is the place also where you can monitor the content of what they're looking up. So if you want music, when you're in iTunes, you only want the clean versions to come up. In the movies, maybe you don't want access to any movies. Um, if you're at school, why would you need movies? You could take that off. Um, if they're on certain websites, if you look here, if you go to websites, if I want to limit um, if I'm allowing all websites or I want to limit adult content, you can actually put specific websites that they are not allowed to go to. Okay, so there's a lot of things on the restrictions that you can do um, as far as, as, as for what it's best for your kiddo. Um, one example I give is I did a, about a year ago, we did an iPad study. It was on visual perception and, and visual um, spatial. And what we were doing is we were issuing iPads to families and they had to do iPads for, um, iPad apps for, you know, an hour a day um, to work on certain features. We basically gave them an iPad um, to take home for those eight weeks. And what we did to those iPads is we stripped it down to where the only thing on there was the apps that we wanted them to work on. So I think that's kind of a powerful message to show that you can um, control um, what they're using or what they're getting onto in a safe way that they can still use it very productively at school. Okay. Um, all right. I know we're a little short on time. Let me get to the get to the good stuff here. Um, when you think about apps, the, um, I always say that the, you use these can these apps to work together. And I'll show you a good example of that with some of these. But using what is in your camera roll or using um, your email. The biggest thing about some of these apps is how can I export them? How can I share them? How can I get them off my iPad and get them in my teacher's hands? That's very, very important. Okay, so we'll show some, um, some uh, examples of how we're going to do that. 
going to go ahead and skip this for just a moment because I want to get to the productivity apps. And these, if I had to pick, if you got an iTunes gift card and you had to know which apps to buy, these would be my favorite right here. Okay. Um, the first one is SnapType or SnapType Pro. It is free or $3.99 for the upgraded version. It is made by an OT, so of course I'm a, I'm a little biased on this one. But this has changed the game, okay? So SnapType is this orange one right here, okay? And what it allows you to do is to take a picture of a worksheet, and that student can complete it right then and there on the iPad, okay? So what it says up here, and I know this is kind of tough to see, but it says new document. When I hit that, it asks me to go to, to my camera or my library. I'm going to go to my camera. Okay, there's my camera. Um, I don't want to mess this beautiful little webcam thing up, so I'm not going to take a picture. I already took one ahead of time so that you can see. But what it allow you to do is take a picture. And here's a, a worksheet. Um, what I can do, though, is I can blow it up. So maybe I need to work on just one problem at a time. Maybe that whole page is just too distracting for me, okay? But instead of handwriting, I can type in my answer right here, okay? Let's see, number two, sunglasses cost $3.99. I want to figure this one. I think the answer is D. So I'm going to put right, I'm going to put my finger right where I want the answer to go. And up here, I can control how big or small I want my, my letters or numbers to be. Okay, so I am basically, I am doing this entire worksheet with my finger. Okay, so let's see. All right, so I'm not going to do the whole worksheet, but when I am done with it, up in the upper right hand corner, there's a little box with an arrow. I am going to turn it into a PDF, okay? And because I can do that, that allows me to email it. So what it's going to do is that worksheet is going to attach as a PDF, and I can email it back to my teacher, okay? So to me, this is very powerful because a lot of times in the past, I think we've waited for teachers to scan um, worksheets or for the aide to, to bring them home and then take the pictures of them. Um, there was, or maybe the email it or the packet. There was a lot of like preparation and work behind the scenes kind of stuff that had to be done. This is so powerful because it is so immediate. As the teacher is handing out the uh, worksheets at class, um, those kids are snapping pictures of it and getting to work on it just like the rest of the kiddos are doing. Um, very, very easy to use. Um, so this is called SnapType. And again, you have the option to print it or turn it into a PDF that can be exported or shared. Okay. The next two apps that I want to show you kind of takes it one step further, okay? Jot Not Scanner Pro is a $4.99 app, and I Annotate is a $9.99 app, okay? Jot Not Scanner Pro is going to be your scanner. It is going to take the picture of your worksheet and turn it into a PDF. I Annotate is where you're going to do all the work, okay? Now, if you're thinking, well, what was the difference between these two and SnapType? They do, they accomplish the same thing, but this is much more extensive. So this is a much more complex um, process. Um, for the kids that are older, this is a better option. Um, for the kiddos that maybe need more annotation tools, this is also another good option for them too. So you'll kind of see. Um, sometimes I have kiddos that, that maybe use snap type just the idea of getting their work done on the iPad. And then eventually, you know, they've, they've learned that well enough that they can transition to JotNot um, and I annotate. So I'm going to show you JotNot. It's this little blue one right here. And you simply press scan down here. And that, again, will default to your camera. All right. So I've already taken a picture of a worksheet, which is right here. In this bottom right-hand corner, I'm going to click it and say open in. Okay, when I say open in, these are all the choices that I could open uh, a PDF in. The one that I want is this little one right here with the I and the A, the red and white one. I annotate. So I'm going to click that. 
So if you think of JAT, now, JAT, that's the scanner. It took the picture. Now I annotate is where you're going to do the work, okay? Again, I can blow this up because maybe I need to work at one section at a time. So that's a nice option. But what I annotate has is, is you have numerous annotation tools and toolbars. So down here in this right-hand corner, it says 1 slash 5. That means I have five toolbars that I created, and I'm using number 1, okay? But up here, I can take a pen, and it's red. I click on it, and I can actually do the worksheet with my finger, okay? The other thing that I can do, I'll make this a little bit bigger, is on my toolbar, there's a T and that stands for typewriter or text box. I can oops, type my answer in. Okay. One thing to know that if you are using an iPad 3 or higher as far as generation goes, okay, because you can't do it on the iPad 2 or the iPad 1s. If you have an iPad 3 or um, higher, it has built-in dictation. And what that means is any time your uh, keyboard comes up and you are connected to wireless, okay, so I am connected to wireless, my keyboard is up, this little icon down here, which is a little microphone, will allow you to dictate. Natural. So instead of typing it, I just dictated my answers in there, okay? The other thing that I annotate has, it has a ton of tools, is you can make custom stamps. So I had made a stamp here with my name, so I click on it, and I just pop my name right there. Click on it, it's a custom stamp, okay? The other thing is if I um, don't want to do a custom stamp, but I selected one of these little circles here, if I click this red circle here, and I want to, maybe I don't have the motor control to circle my answers, but if I just press my answers, it's going to create that circle for me. So tons of different things that you can do, making custom stamps or um, preset stamps that are already available on there. Um, this is a great way to um, annotate a report or to review a report, a study guide. There's a highlighter, there's a pen, there's a marker. Um, if kids want to take notes over a study guide. Um, here's one way, this little, uh, looks like kind of like a cartoon um, note if you want to do here. You could type, this is important. Like a, almost like a little footnote or cliff note that's going to be there, okay? So it's a great way that kids can, if they got a study guide or a, um, let's see, there's a PowerPoint presentation that the teachers did and they emailed it to them, they could use that as a study guide but take their own notes on top of it by opening it up and by annotate, okay? The other piece is that when they are done with this, they have the option to print it or they can email it. And when you email it, you always want to share the flattened version. So that's this one here in the middle. The flattened version will make all of your annotations set in stone, okay? So when I pick the flattened version, it is going to email as a PDF to the teacher and it's going to have all of those markups, all of those annotations, all that work is going to be on there. All right. So that is a very, to me, very important um, piece because you are going to be able to do that work the rest of the class is doing and be able to get it done without having complicating with the handwriting um, and the fine motor. So um, again, you can do vertical pages on here. Um, it is very similar to SnapType, but again, has just more options and tools. Um, the next app is CoWriter, and CoWriter to me would replace something like Microsoft Word or Pages. Um, CoWriter is by Don Johnson. It's a very reputable assistive technology company. Um, for years, they've had programs that they put in the schools on, on computers, but now they finally have an app, so that's pretty exciting. Um, CoWriter, if you go back to your iPad here, is this little app here in the blue. I'll just show you what it looks like right here. And... What it features is text-to-speech and word prediction, which are two huge pieces for writing. So if I were going to type a sentence here, 
Um, it's starting to populate words here for word prediction. Today is Wednesday. Today is Wednesday. Okay, so again, it's given that auditory feedback, which I think is so crucial so the kids know what they're writing. Um, and it also has that word prediction, which is going to cut down on the time that it takes for them to type. Okay, now in your settings up here, you can have them speak every word. You could have them speak every sentence. It's kind of the same thing. You can, you know, do we want them to talk slow or fast? Um, you can do the contrast, so maybe this is better visual for them or white, uh, black on white. You can change the size of the font and things like that. Um, when I talk about word prediction in your word bank, if I go to this little uh, box up here which has the, the little uh, uh, book, it'll let you uh, change the level of uh, dictionary. So for uh, a younger kid or a more basic, you might only want a thousand words in their word bank, okay? But for your older kid, you might need um, more intermediate or advanced words in their dictionary, okay? What CoWriter also has is what they call topic dictionaries. And right here you can see, and it's probably pretty hard to see, but there's six different uh, dictionaries. So it says William Shakespeare, Albert Einstein. Um, if I would turn on, that means, say I started type R-O, Romeo would be a word that would populate as uh, in word prediction. So it's taking those relevant words and dumping them into your word bank, okay? Now, are you only going to write on these six topics? Probably not. So what it allows you to do up at this top bar is you can actually type in a topic and it's going to do a web scraped uh, search. So let's say you're writing on butterflies. So it will do a search out there, but it'll dump the words like cocoon and caterpillar and things that belong to uh, uh, the butterfly uh, category, it's going to put that in your word bank. So for research projects and, you know, your more advanced user, this is a really great app, okay? Um, what I really like about CoWriter, because schools are going to, is if I want to share my document, I go up here to the top, again, that little arrow and box, I can email it. Okay, if I email it though, this is going to show, show up in the body of an email. That's not always what I want it to do, okay? I can tweet it, which I guess can be important, but what I like is you can move this to Google Drive or Dropbox, and I feel like for a lot of schools right now, that's the direction they're going, that we need to be able to get the work these kids are doing and move it to one of these cloud-based sites, okay? The other option is, of course, to copy or print it, which I think is useful also. Um, and then it stores your um, documents here. Um, I only I have a couple that I just demoed here. So, um, but you can keep a running list and you can store quite a bit of your documents there. So that is uh, CoWriter. It also has some spelling support. Um, and like I said, just a really useful um, tool as far as word processing goes. The other one that I wanted to show you is called ModMath. And that is down here in the, the lower right quadrant here. ModMath is a great organizational tool for math. Um, you know, I annotate that I showed you is great um, for doing worksheets. The big bummer though is it always moves left to right because when you type or you write, you move left to right. So it's hard for math in a way um, to become very, very confusing. ModMath isn't maybe the, the key in the the be all, but it's very close to at least helping. Um, number one, it's free, but it basically allows students to create and complete math problems on like a virtual graph paper. So it's very good for organization, for sequencing, legibility. A lot of kiddos that come in and they go to write their math problems and they themselves don't know what, what numbers to add or subtract because it's not lined up and they can't read their own writing to, to know what comes next. Um, this helps with that. So what it is, it's basically just a graph paper, but you can input your math problems. Okay, now this is very, I know you guys won't be able to see it, but as you're doing this, there's a little like cursor that is moving left to right, but the key with ModMath is you can finger and put where you want it to start. 
So, for example, 12 plus 5, I, I don't, the cursor is right next to the 5 here. I want it to go down here, and I want the answer to be 7, and I want it to be over here, and I want it to be 1. So it's basically just, it's not completing any work for them. It's just a way for them to be able to visually get some of their math problems done, um, almost kind of like a scratch paper, but it, it very much helps with the visual and organization piece. Um, when they are done, this can be emailed. So if you pick this little uh, envelope here, and you can say, I want to email this. And again, it's a PDF that goes to the teacher. Okay, That's the whole key. I say that's as good as an app can get is if you can get it off of this iPad as a PDF. I think that's always huge. So um, when that teacher opens up, they're going to see their work lined up um, and, and everything that they did here. So that is ModMath, a great, great, great app to have. The next one is called My Memoir. And it is $1.99, but it's a journaling app. And it's this app right down here with the little pen and the, and the note paper right here. Um, I know a lot of kiddos at the elementary school level, one of their morning work routines is to journal. And they have to maybe draw a picture and then write a couple sentences down. And this, just starting the day off with this kind of demand for some kiddos that struggle with handwriting can really start that day off as, as, as kind of set the tone for it. So my memoir is taking that exact um, assignment and putting it on the iPad. And here's my little, little book here. I'm going to go up here to my um, little, there's a, at the very upper right hand corner there's a little um, calendar. I am going to start an entry for the 19th. It says create new entry. I'm going to click that. Okay, now over here is I need can tap for a picture, okay? And that's another thing, like sometimes just the drawing piece, you know, if you struggle with fine motor and visual motor skills, the chances are that, that just drawing, things are going to be difficult. So this kind of replaces that too. So I can actually tap this and access my camera roll. Maybe I want to write about my dog, so maybe I have a picture of my dog here, and that's who I want to write about. Um, another example, though, is maybe I was in one of those fun apps and I did a um, I did a doodle where I got to make something fun um, and I saved it to my camera roll. Maybe I made this little heart here. Maybe that's the drawing that I want to use. Okay, so maybe that's what I want to journal about. But again, showing how I maybe used a different um, doodle art app to make that say save it to my camera roll. And then that's my picture that I'm going to journal about. So when I start to type, today was a great day. Okay. So now I'm doing my journal entry. But know that I also have the option to dictate. I had a great day at school today. Okay, so again, I have the option to dictate because I have an iPad 3 or higher, I have my um, Wi-Fi on, so this can also lighten that demand as far as the writing goes. When I'm done with my journal entry, I really don't want my teacher have to walk over to my iPad and check my work. So what I can do is up at this upper left-hand corner, there's a little box with an arrow. I can share the PDF and this is going to email to the teacher again. So again, that's the theme of tonight is can I share it as a PDF? Yes, you can. So this journal entry can get off can get off of the iPad and get to that teacher. So that's another one. Um, the final one I want to show you is Audio Note, and this is kind of for our older um, kiddos, the ones that um, are probably maybe more in middle school or, or high school or even college, but it's a $4.99 app, but it combines note taking and voice recording. So what it does is it allows you um, to record a lecture, okay? You can take notes or draw pictures or type anything that you need to know. Um, and then when you go back to play it, you'll know the time that you took that app. Um, 
what it'll do is timestamp it also so when you want to play back you can maybe only listen to the points that you want to hear you can skip around and you don't necessarily have to listen to that whole lecture again and again um, again um, you can insert photos with it um, I don't know if you can see but this is just kind of a demo I always say audio note if you really want to know how to use it the best way is to actually YouTube um, and see some audio note and see some demos on there because they give you a really good clarification on how you can make you can use it um, to the best of the abilities. Um, so you can see right here. And then I also um, I'm not going to show you guys all these, but these are just a list of just kind of functional apps. Um, if you were we apps or kiddo best um, but there's some really simple ones that are free out there that you can trial um, verbally is just text based um, answers yes no is just a simple um, two choice board sounding board is another one by AbleNet where you can do choices of up to one to nine uh, different icons Sonoflex Lite is like your more traditional apps but these are for kids who actually have um, expression difficulties um, if there's a um, same of um, communication, there's the small talk apps um, that can help with like a pain scale or just common phrases. Um, for fine motor coordination, we kind of talked about uh, previously that the iPad is great for productivity and it's great for rewarding, but it can also be great for just working on skills. And Dexteria or Dexteria Junior are some of those apps that work on fine motor control. So they work on like a pincer, they work on finger isolation or um, manual dexterity and speed. So some of those are really good. And then this is kind of geared towards more the, the NF, uh, NF population because visual perception can be an issue. So little, um, little things, doodle find, um, letter reflex is a good one because it works on um, discrimination and reversals so those are all some really good apps that can help as well um, and I just want to go back just for one quick second and show you guys in here too that there's just if um, and this kind of applies more for the kids who have more um, motor disorders and 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 motor control issues but there are all kinds of accessibility things that are out there. There's different mounts um, if you need it mounted to a wheelchair or to a stand or things like that. If direct access is an issue with the iPad, you can actually use a switch with it and it will scan for you. Um, there are key guards out there, um, joysticks. There's a, I always say, this is a nice, cheap, inexpensive way, but if finger isolation is an issue and you have kiddos that are not pressing the iPad accurately, uh, inexpensive um, fix is just getting a stretch glove and then using that to cover the, the hands but then cutting a hole out just for that index finger so that you're hiding the hand so it's not picking up um, you know misses and swipes um, that that hand may need for stability. Um, the camera connection kit is something made by Apple it's actually meant for you to take your photos on your SD card and get them off of your SD card and get them onto your, your iPad. It also has a, a, a connection for a USB, so that can be helpful if you need a um, adaptive keyboard. So Big Keys keyboard has the USB port, so you can connect that to the iPad. Um, I think it's kind of funny because you always get a little pop-up from your iPad that says this device is not supported, you know, stop, 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 do not go on, and you just press OK and you just kind of go on and it will still work. So. Um, but that, let me see, I think we covered. Um, one other thing is functional apps in here. Third-party keyboards is one thing um, that Apple added in this new iOS version of the iOS 8, and that is the ability um, to have different types of keyboards. So when you go here, I'm on my standard keyboard, but if I go to where my little globe is, which for most of us know is like if you want to get to emojis, which there they are, but if you click it again, oops, here's a third-party keyboard, okay? If I click it again, here's another third-party keyboard. So you actually download those from the App Store, and then you go into your settings um, and go to Keyboard, and you would select Add Keyboard, and then it would come up as a selection. But it's just another way to um, either modify or customize your keyboard that you have. 
The other ones that are really good is um, visual schedules. ChoiceWorks has a great um, visual scheduling app that can help for, you know, if there's behavior issues, anxiety issues, transitioning. A lot of kids need predictability in their schedules, and this is just a really good way to help keep them on track with that. Um, and again, we talked about some of the video, video modeling with the Coach My Video. And I think that is it. I'm sorry. I know I kind of ran over here, um, but I always have so much to say because I get so excited. Um, I am happy to field any um, questions. Email is a great way to reach me also. Um, I, I correspond with quite a few people from all over the place um, on email versus different iPad issues as well. Um, Nicole, great job. We've been here at the office. We've been playing with our phones. We've learned just as much tonight, I think. <laughs> to the parents tell us a lot about our um, devices. I think there's things in there that I want to download too and use. Um, I think that would be quite helpful. We, we do have a couple of questions here, so I want to get to them right away in the time that we have. Okay. Um, so let's see. Um, this is one. Um, this mom is asking, she's got a fourth grader. And she wants to know, is there any benefit to teaching the traditional keyboarding versus the hunt and pack? Um, I do think uh, if they are capable of the traditional keyboard, I think, yes, that's going to be benefit because I think in the long run they're going to be faster. Um, the hunt and pack, though, I, I feel like some kids are just very adaptable. And so I, I don't want to discourage that either because sometimes I think – they they find their own ways to become fast and, and productive. Um, so I also think though I also um, say when you do have an iPad and I don't know if you guys can see on on the webcam. Um, I have an iPad that is a it's a I think it's a Logitech one, but it's a keyboard case. And I really encourage a separate keyboard than doing that on screen keyboard because that keyboard is going to give them more tactile feedback when they type, but it's also going to give them more space. So I, whatever way that they do type, I always say it's better to do it on a on a, a Bluetooth keyboard versus versus the on-screen one. Well, that makes sense. Thank you. Um, let's see. Here's another question. Um, this one is um, they're asking you to go back. Where did you say the restriction settings are located? The restrictions are if you go into settings. Let me pull it up here. Go into settings and then go into general and scroll towards the bottom there and you'll see restrictions. It's right under where it says auto lock. Okay. Great. Thank you. Your thing. And let's see, here's another one. It says, will this webinar be available to share with my children's school teachers and OT? Yes, it will be available. This is going to be recorded and in the next couple of days. It will be on the website at nfnetwork.org and we'll have this up on the home page for a little while and then after that it will be um, housed or archived on our webinar. So if you go into, um, I think it's more about NF, the second tab in and then you scroll down and you'll see webinars you'll be able to see all of the recorded webinars and that's where this one will remain. Um, there's another question that just came up. Can using an iPad be included on my daughter's IEP? So that gets a little tricky. I would say um, a lot of times the, the, the IEP team is leery to put a specific piece of equipment on there. Um, that's that's why they, they kind of steer away from putting a swing or putting, you know, an iPad because it's that specific. Um, a lot of times to be a little bit more broad in, is that that she needs, you know, full-time access to um, a portable device, a tablet. Um, but I have seen many, it, a lot of cases that an iPad has been added to that IEP. Um, and a, a lot of it is, like I said, it comes down to is kind of limiting that fine motor during the day, um, using it for productivity. If they've had an assistive technology evaluation through their IEP, um, that could strengthen it because the iPad could very well be recommended from that evaluation. And then here's another one. It says, can you use the speech selection to read you the worksheet as well? No, that is um, not in the case 
of that. Now there are some apps, there's called Claro, it's C-L-A-R-O PDF. And that is supposed to read a PDF as well as let you annotate it. I'm still playing around with that one, and that's one of the reasons why I didn't feature it, because I feel like it's kind of hit or miss. Um, those apps are what they call OCR apps, so um, they're supposed to grab the text there and read it, and then, you know, best case scenario, you'd be able to mark it up. I haven't found one that that works consistently. Um, I feel like a lot of times I do those, and, and I it's like a 50-50% translation rate. So. Um, Hopefully we'll we'll stumble around one, but the the apps that I showed you though you would not be able to because it's grabbing the the text, not the PDF. Okay, well let this be the last question here. It said, would using the iPad for games or movies stimulate a child to the point of having problems sleeping or focusing? I think so. I think so. Um, you know, like everything, you know, as far as screen time, I think it it should be limited. Um, I'm very much a proponent, obviously, of the iPad for productivity reasons, but I think um, especially if doing an iPad or movie before bed is, is, is discouraged just because it, it is pretty stimulating. It's visually, uh, uh, from a visual standpoint it is, but um, I think there's a lot of times that some kiddos respond to this technology where they get so sucked into it that it's very hard for them to um, terminate those kind of activities or, or kind of um, separate from that. Well, Nicole, this has been a fantastic webinar. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Again, my email is there, and I'm, I am very, very open to, to taking any questions or um, emails. Feel free um, to use that. Well, thank you. And there's going to be a survey that pops up for all the participants. Um, if you would uh, be so kind as to fill out that survey after the webinar, that feedback is really important to us. And Nicole has provided for us um, some handouts. And so you'll get a follow-up email from us, all of you who have attended, and it'll have a link for you to be able to access the handouts from tonight. And again, the whole webinar will be available for you to see on the nfnetwork.org website in just a couple of days. I want to thank everybody for attending. And Nicole, thank you very much for the work that you do, um, for the education that you gave us tonight, and for the help that you um, provide for our children down there in St. Louis. Thank you very, Absolutely. very much. Thank you for having me. Good night, everybody.